Thank you very much, everyone. Very nice to join you from uh, a sunny and hot uh, Southern California. Um, and I hope you've all survived the various storms and rains that we're, we're reading about. Um, so, and I apologize for my delay in, being, in, in getting in from here. It was, a bit, it was a bit of a domestic difficulty, but I'm here with my uh, daughter's family and grandchildren. Um, and that's why I'm not in the UK at the moment. Uh, and I think it's quite right that we should be looking at what's happening in the Ukraine. I was originally going to discuss uh, some of the arguments in my book, um, which is coming out next week uh, in Britain. It's called Taking Control. And um, it is partly about the how do you build post-war democracies after post-Trump democracies. Um, and... Uh, it's very relevant to the current situation that we're in. So if I just respond to one crucial point that David just made, because I think that all of us in Britain can quite understand uh, a, having a state and a government which is confused between having been imperial in its kind of imagination uh, and actually trying to become a country or a nation. And this applies in particular to England, which is uh, struggling to work out um, how Scotland or Northern Ireland could be free of its domain. And so I think there's a very big, I think we can, there is a relationship between, um, uh, in our case of a much more moderate and modest uh, and peaceful type, but there's still a relationship between what England is suffering and how this has been expressed in Brexit, and what Russia is suffering, and how this has been expressed in Putinism, and now in this uh, uh, dreadful war of his invasion of the Ukraine. So I just want to say something very briefly about the Ukraine. Because I think that while there is a, um, a, an ideological kind of justification for it, in Putin's rather unhinged or completely unhinged accounts of history, the re in addition to this article where he, which David quotes, where he says that um, uh, Ukraine and Russia are really one Russia, one people, uh, in the 55-minute television talk that he gave, which prepared the way for war, he basically said that he said that the Ukraine was a construct of Lenin's, and. Um, he said they're now taking down the statues of Lenin's and the Ukraine and calling it decommunization. If you want decommunization, I'll show you decommunization, meaning getting rid of Ukraine altogether as an independent state, in, in, a, in the language of a thug. And I think it's important that these, this, this pseudo history that he is invoking, we don't, that we don't take this to be the actual framework of the real motivations and structures of what is happening. And I see what is happening in Russia now as, the, as a response of Putin's fear of democracy, of self-government, uh, and of the rule of law and of human rights in its widest sense. And the thing that really terrified him, in my view, was the uprising in Belarus, which nearly overthrew Lukashenko in, 90, in 2020-2021, last at the ending at the beginning of last year, end of the beginning of last year, and and that sense, you know, he's got uh, Alexei Navalny in prison. He nearly tried he tried to assassinate him, and uh, he's in a situation. And there is a certain parallel here with Trump, who has a relationship with Putin, of um, being a corrupt figure, a corrupt dictator who has lost popular and is losing popular support, is terrified of popular support and can't leave power because they know that their own criminal record would result in their humiliation and imprisonment. So uh, um, Putin, if you like, uh, and there's quite a lot of good articles about this by Russians in, in uh, uh, open democracy, lashed out at the Ukraine in an attempt to save himself and a government now faltering under the shift that is taking place and hopefully will continue to take place in the United States under Biden 
which is a shift against corrupt kleptocratic capitalism of which Putin has proved to be an integral part. And I think therefore what we need to, to look at, so that's the, fr the framework of what is actually happening is a contemporary one. And the surprise, I did not predict the invasion. In fact, I predicted that it wouldn't happen, is that the big surprise is that he has overthrown, if you like, the, the political order, the post-Cold War political order, the political order which opened by declaring itself to be the end of history that began in 1990, 1992, and which is, which is now coming to an end. And he is a creature of that order. And this, his, 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 he's in effect bringing down the, the, a system of which he was the creature, a creature. Um, and, and that's due to its instability. If you like, this is the Russian equivalent of the great financial crash of 2008. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I think, which is very important for us at this moment to understand is that Putin is going to fail. Uh, it is possible for his armies to crush uh, Kiev and uh, uh, then the Dnieper uh, and then, you know, actually to get all the way to the Polish border at enormous cost. It's very unlikely, in my view, that he will achieve this because it involves a motivated army. And he has told the army that basically the Ukrainians are Russians and there won't be any resistance. The wars are very unpopular at home and the sanctions will make it even more unpopular. So he's going to have a, it would be an enormously difficult war uh, um, for him to succeed simply in mili straightforward military terms, even though they're much the superior military power. But then they have to undertake a, 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 an occupation of the Ukraine against an extremely well-armed and highly motivated insurgency, which was having weapons pumped into it across Poland from, from the NATO forces and from the British government, among others. Now, the German government, including anti-aircraft, stinger missiles, uh, and grenade launchers. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's inconceivable in my view, that such a, there's no, there's, you know, from Vietnam to Afghanistan to Iraq, what we know is that you cannot defeat a determined patriotic insurgency with an outside invading force unless you can completely seal the borders and absolutely contain it so that you can then outlast the insurgents. And the, the Russians are not going to be able to do that. Um, so what we're looking at is, is uh, a, a defeat. It could come very rapidly, depending on what happens in Russia. It could take many years. And I think we now need to think about what kind of post-war world is going to be constructed. And here I would simply say that what's very important is to reach out to the Russian people who are proud and potentially democratic people to make them our friends and not to try to reproduce what the military and the industrial complex of our own countries will wish, which is to continue a polarization, military polarization with a rump and resentful Russia. That's what happened after 1992, when the United States, instead of extending a kind of equivalent to a Marshall Plan, instead of building a dem non, relatively non-corrupt and democratic Russia, which is what the Russian people wanted, allowed uh, bankrupted Russia. And out of that came the oligarch capitalism, which has so funded the city of London, uh, filled basins with yachts, um, uh, sort of, you know, supplied Swiss banks with lots of uh, 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 jobs at recycling their, their oligarch money and so on. It's very striking, by the way, that in his State of the Union address yesterday, President Biden singled out the oligarchs and said, we're coming for your yachts and your ill-gotten gains. Um, there were many standing ovations, but I think the Congress was rather shocked at that. And many of them themselves are funded by oligarchs and companies with ill-gotten gains. And there was a sort of moment 
of 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 a, a, an understanding there that there is part of the Biden strategy, not well articulated in my view, but very clear in the uh, their national strategy documents. This is something I write about in in the book. Um, is the way in which they see ending corruption as crucial to defeating Trumpism. That's ending corruption domestically in the United States as well as internationally. And that of course, particularly affects the role of the city of London and the Cayman Islands and the other tax havens which come under British control. So there's an effort here in America, not strong enough, but beginning to do something which Robert Reich in an article in The Guardian called putting democracy in charge of capitalism. And this shift, which was beginning to take place, uh, is what people like Putin or Zinachevsky uh, in uh, the Belarus are really frightened of. Um, and we need to look at, in Britain, it's, it's rather difficult for us, this is what I will end by saying, because we're trapped in the Brexit process. It, it, I'm not a Ramona, but I am definitely a Remainer in the sense that there is no future for England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland um, of a democratic kind outside of the European Union. So we now face a very difficult period of time when another new generation will take us back into being part of the the, uh, of our politically part of our continent. Um, and so we're sort of at the moment in a political situation on the, on the sidelines watching this process, but the process that's happening, especially here in America, is of absolute world importance. The, uh, the forces of Trumpism, in effect, the American equivalent of Putinism, while they have minority support, have a rigged political system that favors them. And the coming election, not the midterms perhaps, but certainly for 2024, is the moment where we will see whether or not Trumpism can return. And if it does, it will clunk click with the dictatorships around the world. And the wonderful aspect of what is happening, of the dreadful events in the Ukraine, is there's a real opportunity to bring down Putin and replace him with a democratic Russia. This is the crucial thing, I think, for us, not just for a democratic Ukraine, which is obviously the immediate issue, but in this longer and global term for a democratic Russia. With a democratic Russia, the possibility of a return of Trump is much diminished. And at that point, we can breathe a sigh of relief. I think I'll stop there.